Hey everyone, and welcome to lesson three of the Theology of the Cross Bible Study. Good to be with you again. Uh, I apologize if the microphone quality is less than usual. I don't have my headset. Um, maybe it's better than usual. I don't know. Uh, you'll have to give me some feedback on that. Uh, but either way, I'm just using my laptop for this recording. Uh, hopefully this works out okay. Uh, we are here with lesson three, Slivers on the Cross. Uh, but before we get into ch chapter three, let's do some of the discussions from last time. Um, just a reminder of our schedule. Here's the video on Saturday. Before Wednesday, please fill out the discussion page and then uh, read the chapter by the next Saturday. So on chapter two, what resonated with you? Uh, Crossbearing is how characters. Cross is how I can identify with the Bible's characters. I think that that is a, a wonderful insight. Um, I think the Bible is unique in that its characters are flawed. Uh, its heroes, its greatest heroes, other than Jesus, its greatest human heroes are deeply flawed. If you look in the Old Testament, um, it really shows us warts and all uh, those characters, which is different than many other ancient documents. Now, in you know, in modern um, literature and such, uh, it's normal to have flawed characters, but back then, with with ancient religious texts and everything, having your heroes be flawed was very weird uh, and unique in, in that era. So good to recognize that, uh, that they were flawed and that they ended up bearing their own crosses, which we, we can relate to. Uh, when I was young, it became easy to not turn to the means of grace. In later years, it is no easier, yet biblical wisdom and suffering turned me toward those same means of grace. Uh, that's a wonderful insight. Uh, I kind of mentioned this last time uh, with the more mature that you get spiritually, the more you realize that you can't do it on your own. Um, the more spiritually mature you are, the more cross-bearing you end up doing. But then the more you get turned toward the means of grace, um, the gospel and word and sacrament. And again, the cross-bearing is not a means of grace, but it so often leads you to the means of grace. It drives you to the gospel. It drives you to the sacraments. This is a little bit of a long one. The power of the gospel and how the law magnifies the power of it. That's what re resonated with this person. Within ourselves, we are powerless to obey the law, but the gospel is that we are free from the law of sin and death. We can take joy in our suffering because we know that the gospel is much greater is a much greater relief than the pain of our suffering. Uh, it's like when tall people tell me you're so short, and I reply that if I weren't for people like me, you wouldn't be considered tall. Uh, I think I know who put this one in. Uh, I will not call out that person by name, Colleen, but um, you know I, I think that's a good that's a good point that. Uh, the suffering in life compared with the glory and the relief of the gospel, um, it's always greater, you know? And so when we get to see that suffering in life, it, it deepens our appreciation for what Jesus has done for us. One overarching doctrine. You can't say that one part of the Bible is true and one part isn't. It's all or nothing. Uh, yeah, very true. Um, if you start picking and choosing from the Bible, then you're never going to agree with anyone because they can pick and choose something differently than you. Uh, that's, that's why we take it all. Uh, and we, we read the Bible for what it is, which is the inspired word of God. I continue to be impressed with Deutschlander's ability to describe and clarify the very thoughts I, and we all think, uh, yeah, that's one of his gifts as a, as a writer and as a, as a teacher too. The Holy spirit is working a miracle in our hearts through hearing or reading God's word. Yeah. That's something that we don't often think about. Uh, definitely resonates here because um, you think about the, the fact that just hearing the word of God is, is the Holy Spirit doing his work. Um, you know, the, the fact that we've been converted from death to life, from darkness to light, uh, that is a miracle, the miracle of God that he can take a, a poor sinner like me and turn me on the path to heaven. That is something that only God can do. And he continues to do it every single time we're refreshed with his word. And that's a, that's a beautiful insight. One point I questioned later was the statement, for though I am no better than Paul, I am no worse either, on page 49. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Uh, you know, Paul calls himself the worst of sinners. Um, and so we can say that, I can say I'm the worst of sinners. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm no better than Paul, nor, nor am I worse than Paul. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think I would probably call myself worse than Paul, but, but really the point is that we are all the worst of sinners. We're all... Um, we know our sin better than anyone else. Um, you know, that, that sin that is in your heart, those secret sins that only you know of, um, 
and someone else knows and that's God. And so when that sin is laid bare between you and God, yeah, you feel like the worst of sinners. Uh, I think that's what the point was there. Uh, this was a question. There weren't too many questions, so I put them in this slide. Uh, can you put a link to the video on the announcement page? I had trouble finding it today. Yes, the next um, announcement in the bulletin will include a link to the YouTube channel um, so you can see these videos. Oh, I didn't animate this. Um, oh, well, take these one at a time. Uh, it's an easy read, and it seems appropriate during this current world crisis. Uh, I, yeah, I think so, too. I think that's one of the reasons I chose it for uh, what we're going through right now as a society, is that the idea of cross-bearing is certainly relevant to what we are dealing with collectively right now. Uh, here's a question. Can you please refer to the pages more uh, as we go through the chapter, trying to make notes? Uh, yes, I will do that. Thank you for the comment. Um, I will. I have my book here. I will be paging through it as we go. Uh, and I also put some page numbers on the PowerPoint for today uh, that will help us kind of uh, keep in step. So thank you for that feedback. I sense that Deutschlander is speaking to ministerial students, uh, very similar to how Walther and his lectures on the long gospel. I've always held those lectures as an excellent treatise on the distinction between the long gospel. This book runs that same path. Yes, I think Deutschlander, I mean, his context of ministry was was ministry education, right? You know, he... He was a professor at Northwestern. He was a professor at MLC for a brief minute. Um, uh, his ministry context was speaking to ministerial students. So that's kind of the, the voice that he has. And if you've ever heard him speak, you can hear him speak when you read the book. Uh, I, I've only listened to Deutschlander a couple of times. I've only been to one lecture of his um, as a guest speaker. But his, his tone is undeniable. And I think that has something to do with it. Uh, a comment in the fact that man's fundamental problem is his relationship to God. Yeah. Um, the fact that our relationship with God is broken and we desperately need it to be reconciled. Uh, that is really the, at the heart of long gospel preaching. Whatever Satan or the world would do against us must first pass in review before God. What is too bad he removes. He lets come through to us only what he knows we can handle that will serve for our good. Job is a good example of that. Uh, the sentiment here is good. I do want to tweak the wording just a little bit to get us to think a little bit differently in that God doesn't promise to give us, uh, God doesn't promise not to give us more than we can handle. In fact, what he says is that sometimes we will be given more than what we can handle. And that in those moments, that is when we turn to him for strength. Okay. Uh, he does say that we will not be tempted beyond what we can bear. But I think some people get, get confused with that he won't give us any challenges that we can't bear. The truth, the fact of the matter is that God often says, or God often sends challenges to his people that they would never be able to bear on their own, but that he gets them through. Um, and so when the challenges and storms rise in life and they do send us to our knees uh, because we can't bear them, that's when he comes and he lifts us up. Okay. So. I, I agree with what this commenter is saying, but I do want to get, to get us to think that sometimes God does send us more than what we can bear because that means he gets to bear it for us and we get to rely on him. And that's really a lot of what cross-bearing is. So thank you for that comment. Um, you know, just another way of thinking about it. Let's get into chapter three, slivers on the cross. Um, I don't think Deutschlander used this passage, but I think it makes sense in this context. First, Tim, Second Timothy 4 Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around themselves a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. So I think that that makes a lot of sense with what this was talking about today in the Slivers on the Cross, really talking about society and how it reacts to cross-bearing. Um, and how then it affects us as well. Uh, what we see a lot is that people in the world turn to what their itching ears want to hear instead of relying on the Bible for truth. Um, and so when the Bible proposes, and not just proposes, but, but declares truth, um, they get the response, uh, well, that's just like your opinion, man. Uh, they take the truth and they treat it like it's just something you can take it or leave it, uh, which is really kind of the, um, the attitude toward the truth that, that a lot of society has in general right now, which we'll get into. 
Oh, but I think that this passage is a good governing passage for us to look at when it comes to these slivers on the cross. On page 66, Deutschlander gets into the Age of Enlightenment. Uh, this is the mentality, um, this is the philosophy that America was born out of. So we shouldn't be surprised um, that America so encapsulates the, the principles of the Age of Enlightenment. Because if you think about, I mean, Thomas Jefferson is one of the key figures in what's known as the Age of Enlightenment. Um, and, and, you know, other, other people in that same era, Franklin, uh, Ben Franklin, um, Voltaire in France, um, all of these people, I think Adam Smith would count uh, as, as somebody in the Age of Enlightenment. Um, these principles of the Age of Enlightenment, the, the, the search for the truth, uh, kind of the moving past uh, religion as a necessity, all of these things that America was really born out of and the American Revolution sprung out of in 1776 and the surrounding years. Um, uh, Marx, Lenin, you know, all, all this stuff that, that, that come out of the Age of Enlightenment. I've referenced this before, but Thomas Jefferson, you know, people refer to the founding fathers as Christians. Uh, America was a Christian nation, founded as a Christian nation. Um, that is not super true. Uh, what the founding fathers were, they, they were kind of a quasi-religious group. Um, generally, most of the founding fathers, especially Jefferson, were what we call deists, um, where they believe in some kind of higher power, but a, it's a distant power. It's not a personal God. Um, they may have believed in a God, but they would have called him uh, something like a divine watchmaker, where the, the God designs everything and he, he tinkers it and he, he makes it exactly how he wants it to go. And then he winds it for a couple thousand years and then lets it go and lets the watch run. And then he sits back and does nothing. That was more of the concept of God that people like the founding fathers and the people in the age of enlightenment had. Uh, and then even that, even the divine watchmaker analogy started to fall into disfavor uh, as other principles of the Enlightenment came forward as well. Deutschlander gets into that on, seven, on 66 when he starts talking about evolutionary theory. Um, evolutionary theory not only changed how we view creation and the principles set, is set forth in Genesis, uh, but evolutionary theory kind of sparked a change in how authority was established um, and how the people viewed the Bible as being established. Evolutionary theory was not only for the origin of species, um, it's also, it, it has wormed its way into the origin of philosophy and thought as well, which he gets into on the next page. He goes from evolutionary theory to talking about the rejection of inspiration and the rejection of the authority of the Bible, okay? So the, the, the jump there, is that, well, if there's no real creator, if everything was by chance and, and evolution is what propagated everything, well, then there must have been some evolutionary process for how scripture became to us as well. Um, and the idea that it, it's just a collection of documents that got put together, different mythological traditions that got jammed together in what is called the Bible now, um, and people trying to dig through and find the original sources from the materials and, and splitting the Bible up, uh, splitting the, the first five books of the Bible up into four different um, sources and identifying which one, which source uses the word Yahweh and which source uses the word Elohim, which, which source is the priestly source, which source is the, the redacted source. You know, all these things that like, well, the Bible must have evolved too if, if humans have been around for, you know, millions of years. Um, how, could, how could this Bible have any type of authority? Okay, so that's these are the kinds of implications that we get from the Age of Enlightenment uh, when people start questioning the foundations of society and the foundations of our existence and the foundations of our thought and the foundations of our religions as well. And now that the Enlightenment has happened, now religion is kind of viewed as like this, ah, well, if you want it, go ahead. If it makes you happy, go ahead. Um, but nobody who nobody who's anything actually believes that stuff. Nobody intelligent actually buys into that garbage. Um, but you know, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna criticize you if, you if you do it, but as long as it doesn't infringe on me. Okay, and that's, that's a post-enlightenment um, mindset. And, and remember, America was born out of the enlightenment. So 
Um, what you see in society today, it's not new, uh, nor is it novel, uh, nor is it unexpected. Here is a, uh, a Facebook post that was shared with me uh, from a Hendersonville Facebook group. And I think you get to see here some of these slivers on the cross, um, the post-enlightenment philosophy kind of thing. I'm just gonna read it here. Hello, we are excited to be moving to Hendersonville in a couple of weeks. When things settle down with COVID, we'd love to find a church to join. Nomination, not important, but would like a church that is family friendly. We have a one-year-old. Okay, great. More theologically liberal uh, and explained not as much based on literal strict interpretations of the Bible, but more focused on life lessons. Um, so in other words, we don't want the gospel. We just want the, the stuff that makes me feel good. We, want, we don't want law and gospel. We just want morality. Uh, we tend to lean more socially liberal in support of gay marriage, so our policies to address climate change, etc. So we would want a church that is at least not outspokenly anti-homosexuality or extremely conservative. Okay, so again, picking and choosing what they want to hear, what they don't want to hear, 2 Timothy 4. Uh, more casual dress code, more relaxed atmosphere would be preferred. Great, fine. Is there a church like this in Hendersonville or nearby? Thank you. I think you would maybe not be surprised that nobody recommended Rock of Ages, um, because if we're going to be talking about this person doesn't want a literal interpretation of the Bible, um, they don't, they want to pick and choose the things in the Bible that make them uncomfortable and take them out. That's not how we roll here. We take the Bible as the authority. Um, it's one unified doctrine. Uh, but this mentality is pervasive. And I think it also affects us more too than maybe we realize we're going to get into that too. Um, but, but we do have to be on guard for it and, and be understanding of it too. Uh, be understanding of the fact that this is how people think. And if we want to approach people, sometimes we got to meet them where they're at. Right. So I just thought this was very good. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Colleen, for sharing this with me uh, from the Hendersonville, it's positively Hendersonville, I think is the name of the Facebook group. Um, it's uh, apt to today's lesson. Here we have uh, what is called the postmodern divide. Um, modernism and postmodernism. Uh, he gets into this on page 69. Although I don't know if he uses the words modernism and postmodernism specifically, uh, but he talks about the concepts. So what the Enlightenment brought was this idea of modernism, that we can discover the truth in scientific fact and things that are based in, in demonstrable evidence. And as we gain knowledge of the truth, we ascend as a species and move forward into the next uh, age built on the truth of what we can discover, okay? Postmodernism is opposed to that in the sense that it denies the sense that there is an such thing as absolute truth. Modernism is concerned with finding the absolute truth. Postmodernism is, post is concerned with disassociating from the truth. And that's where he gets into that on page 69. He says, Pontius Pilate's question, what is truth? Um, that, is, that is the question of society today, is what is truth? Well, your truth might be different than my truth. And, and we hear that and we go, that doesn't make any sense. There's only, if it's true, it's true. If it's not, it's not, right? Um, but that's, the, that's what postmodernism has, has done. Um, this, this new idea of thought, again, growing out of the enlightenment that, well, what's true for you can be true for you as long as it doesn't have to be true for me. Okay, and I, I think this is a funny comic too. The postmodern or the modernist says, I am a genius, I've discovered the truth. The postmodernist, the category of genius is a theoretically untenable cultural concept. But meanwhile, he's thinking to himself, I'm such a genius. Um, I, I like that a lot. There's something interesting, you'll notice how I titled this slide post slash modernism. Um, that is kind of this, uh, people are diagnosing the, the thought of the world today, the philosophy of the world today. And they're saying it doesn't really, it's not really purely modernism, and it's not really purely postmodernism either. It's this kind of mishmash of the two where we want to be modern in certain things. In other words, focused on the truth and finding the truth. Um, and in certain things, we want to do that. But in other things, we want to pick and choose the truth and have my truth versus your truth. Um, postmodernism, right? So a term for this is post slash modernism. I don't know how you say it out loud. I've only ever read it, uh, but post-modernism, post-slash-modernism 
is this combination where we want to be modernists with certain things and postmodernists with other things. Those things would be 21st century modernism would be in the areas of science and math. And then 21st century postmodernism would be with things like ethics and morality and religion. So in the areas of science and math, there's indefutable, ir irrefutable evidence, and we have to bow to that at all times. But then when we get into ethical questions, well, then your truth can be different than my truth. Uh, with religious questions, your truth can be different than my truth. Philosophy, your truth can be different than my truth. Um, and these things conflict and clash in a lot of areas. Uh, one, one way or, or one place I could think of it would be abortion. Um, that, you know, there's, there's it, science would say that this is a person, or that this, this is a human, uh, how, how do I say this? Science would say that a, fe a fetus is a human, right? And so that's demonstrably true. Can't deny it. It is a human. But then the ethical postmodern side would say, but is it a person? You know, it, it's a human, but is it a person? The, per, the, it, the human is undeniable, but does that human life, does it have any value? Has it, has it achieved personhood yet? And so there's this, there's this sharp divide between people who view life and, and, the, and the soul as one continuous thing, but then there's people who would say, well, it's not really a person until it could survive on its own, or it's not really a person until X number of weeks or months. Um, and that's where you get this post slash modern divide. The modernistic truth, demonstrable truth of, of the humanity of this child, unborn child, then the postmodern um, uh, choice of whether or not that life has actual value as a person yet, okay? Uh, if you have questions on that, please let me know, but that, that is an interesting place where this collides and it's not the only place where it collides. Deutschlander says, are we affected more than we think? We are children of the age in which we live. All of these things have an impact on us. No one is immune to the loud and insistent assaults of culture against the soul. Whether we are always aware of it or not, we absorb never-ending blows of our culture against the realities of truth and error, heaven and hell, God and the devil. This is on page 73. I think there's wisdom in this. Um, there's a... You know, we, we want to rely on, on absolute truth when it comes to the Bible and everything, but I think that the whole post-slash-modern divide, it does affect us as well, um, especially when you consider things like, you know, where are you getting your news from? Do you only get your news from one source and then any other source is, is bad or lies? And then you get to pick your news source and you get to pick your truth based on that news source. And when news sources collide, you say, well, I'm going to go with, with X news source over Y news source. Um, because X news source says the things that agree with what I think and Y news source says things that don't agree with what I think. And so what, you're, what you can effectively do is pick your truth. Now, I, I'm not saying that, um, you know, there, there are some news sources that spread lies. There are some news sources that don't research and, you know, those kinds of things. And those we got to be watching out for. Um, but, you know, when you get to picking and choosing your truth, you know, and while this, this article has data that I'm going to ignore because it doesn't match my own narrative, um, we can find situations where people do that. And we can, we can do it ourselves too, where then we kind of create these echo chambers and we only want to listen to the sources that agree with what we already think, right? What we're effectively doing there is, is picking our truth instead of looking at anything objective. Now, I, I will admit it's harder and harder to be objective today, um, especially with, you know, just people throwing uh, insults and mockery and everything on all sides and, and, and what can you believe anymore? Um, that's a valid question and a valid challenge. It is a challenge, but we've got to be careful that we don't just uh, um, only pick the things that confirm what we already think, um, that we don't play into confirmation bias. I'm going to believe this source or this article because I agree with it. And I'm not gonna believe this one because I disagree with it. There's value in reading things you disagree with and there's value in reading things that, that give you hard evidence and data that you can look at and learn from, uh, even if it challenges your notions of how things should be or are. Now, that doesn't mean that we do that with the, the Bible, right? You know, the Bible is the truth and we, we lean on it, we rely on it. 
Uh, we don't want to pick and choose. We talked about that already. Picking and choosing from the Bible really dismantles the authority of the Bible. So you see where this is tough, right? You see where this uh, becomes difficult to be in caught in between these two philosophies. You know, am I seeking the truth or am I choosing my truth? And seeking my truth with certain things and then choosing my truth with other things, um, it, is, uh, it is tough. It is hard. And it makes us ask the question, like Deutschlander does, are things getting worse? Uh, page 75, he, he goes on and, and he makes the statement uh, that uh, things are getting worse. The end is always nearer than it was um, true. Um, each age is accordingly more resistant to the gospel. I kind of, so here's where I kind of disagree with Deutschlander is that I don't buy into that. I, I look at what Solomon says, and he says there's nothing true under, or there's, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, and, you know, history often rhymes. It, history doesn't repeat, but it often rhymes. And, you know, the denial of the authority of the Bible that goes on today, it's not new. It's, it maybe is different. Maybe, maybe it's the default, which is surprising. But the thing about other eras of history where the authority of the Bible was outright denied and it was, you know, not considered authoritative. I mean, it, when the early Christians were doing their thing, that was the case. Uh, the world at large had no use for a Bible or this new religion that was coming around. You know, everything, everything we find today is just a copy of something that has happened in the past. And I personally, while I do agree that, you know, we're getting closer and closer to the end, and that Jesus says, watch out for the times and days are perilous. Um, I'm hesitant to say things like, you know, things are worse now than they've ever been. Or, um, you know, we're, we're in the, it was so clear that we're in the end time. Well, we've been in the end time for thousands of years, right? I mean, since Jesus has left, we've been in the end time. So this is a point where I disagree with Deutschlander, or at least I soften what Deutschlander says. Things are different now than they were maybe 50 years ago or 100 years ago. I'm not going to say that things are worse because there are also opportunities here too. If people have been denying that there is absolute truth in the world and that has been the prevalent thought for, you know, a hundred years, what that does is it creates a vacuum of a need for absolute truth. And who can fill a vacuum for a need for absolute truth but us? You know, so there's an opportunity there in a post slash modern world where we can provide people with the truth that whether they know it or not, their hearts are desperate, desperately craving, right? So while it is challenging, there's always challenges. And while it is challenging, it also provides opportunities too. So um, I'm willing to be just, you know, to, to disagree on this one. Uh, I don't see it the same way Deutschlander does here. Um, but I think I've maybe given this speech before, so I'm going to move on. How do we get through this then? How do we deal with this post slash modern divide? How do we deal with the fact that we've been affected more by this um, age of enlightenment philosophy than maybe we even realize? How do we deal with it if things look so much like they're getting worse? What is the answer on page 75, Billy Chandler says, it is the bold and unflinching answer of the Bible itself. That must be the answer. Now on the next page, he quotes, Peter, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of everlasting life. And that is what we cling to. That is what we hold to in any and all circumstances. That is what we need is to counteract these slivers on the cross, the slivers of society that affect us, um, the, 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 the poisoning of the waters when it comes to what we take in on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of thought and philosophy and, and entertainment. Um, how do we deal with it? How do we get through it? We rely on the Bible. And one of the things that cross-bearing does is it drives us back to the word and it drives us back to the means of grace. And it gets us to rely more and more closely and fully on God. Okay. So we can either, we can sit and lament about how things are getting worse, or we can acknowledge that things are tough and challenging and pick up our crosses and carry Christ. He does get into a little discussion on uh, Acadia or Acadia. Um, in Greek, it would be Acadia. Uh, I think we would pronounce it as Acadia uh, in, in English. This is on page 81. He starts this, this question. Um, 
talks about Dante's Divine Comedy. That's like Dante's Inferno, Dante's parody. So that's that kind of stuff. And then he references Purgatorio. Um, Asidia, indifference or apathy. He does mention this. He says the word is not found in the Bible specifically. Uh, he, he mentions that. Um, where, does, where does he say that? The, the Bible, oh, uh, bottom of 81. While the Bible does not spend time on the term, it deals with the malady. In other words, you're not going to find the Greek word asidia in the Bible, but you will find the concept. Okay, uh, we'll get to that in Revelation here. Luther on Asidia says, a malignant, pernicious plague with which the devil bewitches and deceives many hearts, so that he may take us by surprise and stealthily take the word of God away again. If we are indifferent toward the word of God, uh, uh, sooner or later, Satan is going to, we're going to be putting ourselves in a position where Satan can come and snatch it. Walter, how many thousand, many thousand times more fall again out of grace through laziness and lukewarmness than through open sins and vice? This is, this is a, a really good quote for us to consider, especially for those of us, who, especially for those of us who have been wells all of our lives. This is a really good quote to consider. Um, you know, just because we've, sometimes being born into this uh, can be a challenge because we are more prone to this indifference or apathy or acidia. We got to watch out for it. Um, Jesus speaks to the church in Laodicea. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other. So because of you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Uh, it, there's an interesting, interesting historical point here. Um, cold water would have been refreshing and, and, and beautiful and, uh, you know, fresh drinking water that was cold meant so much to people. Uh, and that was, I believe, to the, to the south of Laodicea uh, was a freshwater spring and a river. And, you know, the Laodiceans had to travel outside their city to get to that beautiful, cold, fresh water. Hot water, also extremely useful for other things. Um, you know, hot water springs meant a lot to people. Societies were built on hot water springs. Hot water springs were to the north of Laodicea, where they had to travel outside the city to get to them. The only things that, the only type of water they could get in Laodicea itself was either uh, lukewarm water that was pulled up from, from down below, uh, that they could only drink lukewarm water, or they could get lukewarm water as it runs down from the hot springs, uh, and then by the time it gets to them, it's useless. So when Jesus is talking about the lukewarmness of the Laodiceans, they would they would get it. They would say, "Okay, we need to be either either refreshing or useful. We we have to do something here because this indifference, this asidia, this apathy that we have, um, it's dangerous." Okay, and Jesus calls it out very directly with the Laodiceans. Finally, uh, one last point here, and this is kind of summing it up, uh, similar to this point about, you know, relying on the cross, or relying on, on Jesus and the cross. Uh, this words from Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with his passions and desires. We've been talking a lot about the self, the italicized self, the character of the self. Um, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified that self. And now we need to bear our crosses. Um, Deutschlander quotes this on page 86, Galatians 5.24. The essence of the cross is self-denial. If we're going to bear our crosses, we must deny self. Um, if we're going to be ready to deny self, we've got to be ready to bear the cross and vice versa. It's a necessary part of the Christian life. Um, and when we have these slivers on the cross, the, the struggles against society that disagrees with what we say and who doesn't want to view truth as absolute uh, and who denies the authority of the Bible, uh, those are crosses for us. Those are slivers on this cross that as we bear it, we're going to have to deal with those pains and difficulties of witnessing to such a world. But those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with his passions and desires. We, we die to ourselves so that we can proclaim the truth of God. We bear the crosses so that we can share the glory of, of Jesus with others, even when they don't think they need it. Um, one of the slivers on this cross is preaching to a world that desperately needs it but doesn't know it, right? So uh, that is the essence of, of uh, the slivers on the cross in society. That's what I've got for you today in chapter three, lesson three. Thank you for reading. Thank you for listening. 
um, Google form is ready. I believe that's the correct link. Uh, I will make sure it's in the YouTube video description as well. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, you know where to put those in the Google form. You can email me too if you want a, a, a longer response or anything more specific. Um, God's blessings to all of you. The next chapter is Slivers Under the Cross, and we're going to find out uh, what those differences are. Um, yeah, I was going to I was, I was gonna summarize, but I'm not going to because you can just read the chapter. Uh, so Slivers Under the Cross is next. Uh, look forward to reading that and gaining more insight as to what it means to bear crosses as a Christian as we've been doing this whole, this whole study. Thanks for tuning in today. Let me know if you have any questions. God's blessings to all of you. Stay safe out there. And uh, we will see you soon.